So hello, peace builders, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our season finale of Together for Peace. I am your host, Reem Gunaim. We stand tall to promote and ensure human rights to all people, especially those under oppression. To create real peace, we must uplift vulnerable communities, share their voices, and cultivate attitudes, structures, systems where all people can live in dignity. Peace Builders' role in advancing mutual understanding makes us responsible to engage in difficult conversations, listen to experiences different from our own, acknowledge internal biases, and embrace the discomfort of learning and evolving. We must collaborate and grow together as a unified and compassionate community for peace. In solidarity with Black communities in America, we want to create opportunities for positive dialogue about the advancement of racial justice, diversity, and inclusion in the U.S. and beyond. The current events in the United States bring us together as an international community to elevate, reflect, and address racial discrimination and oppression in all corners of the world. To honor the life of George Floyd and the lives of countless others lost, we pledge to raise awareness by elevating the voice of the oppressed to expose the ambiguity where injustice to human rights thrives. Today is Juneteenth, uh, the holiday celebrating 155th anniversary of America's prominent legislation of peace, the liberation of black people from slavery. To celebrate this day of liberation and peace, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce to you one of my favorite mentors and role models, Carolyn Jones. So now for Carolyn intro, I would like to ask you all to please take a deep breath and close your eyes and start imagining. Imagine that life is a, the judge of the courtroom. Carolyn is the persecutor against the systems, structures and attitudes in place that defend racism, oppression and discrimination. Every time Carolyn steps into the courtroom of life, she carries the truth within her heart. This truth manifests in her essence, values, mindset, and hard work. Throughout Carolyn's life, she overpowered racism, misogyny, and discrimination by consistently making choices to never accept them for her destiny. Through her actions, Carolyn continued to set precedence and break every, every glass ceiling on the truth that her skin color, gender, and her humanity is to be celebrated in their own right. Her success is the evidence that we can overcome racism, oppression, and discrimination when we choose to believe in the power within ourselves. Carolyn said the verdict that racism is a reality originating from false delusions and supported unchallenged accomplices. Carolyn's beauty shines through as a human rights attorney and a phenomenal Rotarian. Carolyn has been a voice of truth for the sick, the poor, and the voiceless. Her journey started in a small so socially segregated town in New York, and now she is forever memorialized in the Alaska Women's Hall of Fame. She earned her education from Stanford and Yale Law School. She protected the rights of others for 31 years as an attorney for the Alaska Human Rights Commission an assistant attorney general for the state of Alaska, as well as a supervising attorney for the same office. Within the first year, women were allowed in Rotary. Carolyn joined the Rotary Club of Anchorage East. Within a five year period, she advanced from member to board member, to president, to governor, governor of Rotary District 5010. This is the largest Rotary District in the world, including all of Alaska, Yukon territory in Eastern Russia. Through her powerful leadership skills and kind humanitarian heart, she became the first woman in the world to be a Rotary Foundation trustee. Her dedication to service has earned her numerous awards within Rotary and the nonprofit sector, including Rotary Service to Buff Self Award and Volunteer of the Year by the Russian Children's Foundation for her role in educating underprivileged children in Moscow. Carolyn is a selfless leader who follows her heart to do what's right. Her story demonstrates how culture, law, and race intersect, influence progress, and shape solutions for positive peace. 
without further ado, let's start this enlightening conversation with the one and only phenomenal Car Carolyn Jones. Um, happy Juneteenth, everyone. So Carolyn, I will start right from the beginning. You grew up in Terrytown, and that's a small, um, your small home, hometown. Can you tell us how your town was segregated? How was it like for you to live in that town? Terrytown, uh, when I was uh, growing up, had a population of 12,000 people. And there were just two groups at that time, blacks and whites. Um, I lived on a street that was one block long. Everybody who lived on that street was, in those days, colored. And the perpendicular streets uh, had houses and whites lived there. And in fact, in my backyard, there was a fence at the border of my backyard. And on the other side of the fence was a house lived in by whites. Um, so there, there were definitely delineated players, uh, places in Terrytown where we each lived. Um, so that was obvious. And um, yeah. can, you, can you share with us like your experience going to school and what your teacher told you growing up? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I owe being here talking to you probably to Miss Tolliver. She was my third grade teacher. And she took me aside one day and she said, um, you know, you get good grades, you like studying, you like education, you're really smart. Uh, there's probably lots of things you could be out there waiting for you. But people are going to tell you because of the color of your skin that you can't. Don't believe them. However, you need to go to college and you're going to need scholarships to do that. And for that, you need good grades. So you need to make up your mind right now that you're going to get the best grades you can get for the rest of your years and get those scholarships. And uh, it really stuck in my mind. And what's your philosophy um, about that you should earn it yourself? You always you have this famous statement that I love. Yes, well, um, it, it probably comes from even before Miss Tolliver because I'm an only child of a single working parent and I had to take care of myself a lot. Um, but what I like to say is, if it is to be, it is up to me. Yes, and so tell us, Carolyn, about your family. Like you grew up, yes, listening to your teacher empowering you, observing segregation, but also listening to your uh, family's history of um, of discrimination and, and, and racism. And so can you share with us the story about your grandmother? You mean my great grandmother? Yeah. Um, yes, I, I know when we talked that that story really resonated with you and I'm going to tell it, but I want to make it clear that this what I tell you about her it is not unique. Um, this story about my great grandmother is the story of all black women in the 1800s and the 1700s. Um, actually, uh, this event happened a few years after uh, the Civil War when um, uh, Blacks were emancipated. She was working in a hotel and uh, one of the clients snatched her into his room and he raped her. And eventually that rape produced my, my grandfather. Um, my grandfather was uh, uh, very, very fair skinned with straight hair in complete contrast to the rest of his siblings. Uh, that was not a good look in Virginia, and so eventually they sent him north to live in Philadelphia with relatives. But the point I want to make is what happened to my great-grandmother happened to every woman then. They don't teach you this in, in American history, but the blacks, when they were slaves, they weren't humans, they were property, and they belonged to the white owners and any time a white male wanted a female, he just went down to the black shanties and helped himself to whichever female he wanted, regardless of her age. And visit, men visiting, say if they had a family holiday like Thanksgiving or Christmas, and the uncles and brothers came to visit, uh, they had the same opportunity. Uh, every, every woman uh, was a victim of rape back then. Wow. And that's um, in the mid-800s? or. Well, at the entire time of slavery, but but my the story that I'm telling you happened around the early 1870s, so okay. it was shortly after slavery. But um, that was no different than uh, during slave days. Wow, um, and that um, so from your like legal lens 
So there was no rights, like under slavery, there was no legal rights basically for people under slavery. Like today we're celebrating, uh, we're, we're proud of the Me Too movement that elevated, you know, the issue of women rights to have a safe place, workplace and defend their sexual, like, you know, def like they're not, that sexual discrimination is not accepted in our society. But if we look backward at this, like those women were raped and had no place to go. Um, so can you tell us a little bit like how the, how, what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, that, that's the way it was back then. I, blacks had no voice. They had no rights. Um, so I, 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 would, I would bet, you know, I'd bet the farm that my great grandmother didn't go and tell her hotel boss what happened. Um, he would care more about his client than he would care about her. She was just, uh, you know, she was expendable. There'd be plenty more blacks out there ready to have a job. Uh, and, and actually, you know, um, these protests right now are another example of people. Protests are the language of people who have no voice. And so that's what they're doing right now for a different reason. Uh, so we continue to evolve, but, um, and that's your story. Um, so I wanna take us back to your teacher. Uh, can you remind me of her name again? I forgot her name. Miss Tolliver. Tolliver, Miss Tolliver. So um, around that time also you had in school friends. So you were, uh, so can you tell us about your friend at the time and how you, you personally, the first time you really felt racism so powerfully as a kid? Um, You know, when I was in school, in elementary school, I really did like school and I got, it was, I, school, schooling came easy to me. I got a lot of compliments. That was always nice. That made me want to uh, get better and get more compliments. And, and I, I tended to hang around with the other kids who were also getting good grades and they were all white. Uh, one of them, like me, was taking the cello in the orchestra. We started in the second grade and we hung out, we were tight. And every year that Nancy had a, um, a birthday party, she'd invite all the, the little girls, other little smart girls, and we'd all go to her house and have a nice uh, birth, traditional birthday party. Then she had her party in seventh grade, and I learned of it after it was over. I hadn't been invited. That was the, her first boy-girl party. And, and that's when it, I just understood that uh, you just didn't invite a colored girl to a, a boy girl party back in the 50s. Uh, yeah. that, I, I, that really hurt and, and to this day I remember it. <laughs> yeah, but you did not listen to that nonsense and you listened to the words of um, Mrs. Tolliver. You did not believe them and you kept on getting great grades. Um, mm -hmm. And later on you got how you got your scholarship in Stanford. So can you tell us about you being the minority in Stanford? How did that look like at, at that time? Yeah. So I started Stanford in 1959. Uh, our entering class had about 1,100 students. And uh, we Blacks were the largest entering class of uh, Black students from America. There were five of us, three girls and two boys. And all the girls all lived, we're all in the same dorm. We didn't, uh, we, we weren't roommates, but we were all in the same dorm. The two guys lived in two different uh, housings. Um, in my four years at Stanford, I never had a date. Why is that? <laughs> I just told you why. Because that, you there wasn't, inter there wasn't the much in the way of interracial dating in 1959 to 1963. And there weren't any guys to date that, that were my skin color or my race. So, which also at Stanford, at the same time you were experiencing this firsthand, you learned about the Lovings uh, case. Um, so the Lovings, like how the, uh, the constitutional right that interracial marriage was allowed. Um, so have you like, and how we, um, but it's interesting to me how, yes, there's a, a law in, in the Constitution that the case of the loving is um, allowing for racial interracial marriage. But in reality, 
that was not yet a, a common practice. Do you have thoughts on that? If you're talking about the opinion called Loving versus the State of Virginia? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, that's how I always think of it. I, I, I didn't learn of that case until uh, law school in my constitutional law class. Um, I, th I, I thought those were, that was one brave, crazy couple, uh, but they, they did it. So for people who are listening to us, Carolyn, uh, do you want to brief them on the gist of that story? Um, of, because not everybody who's listening to us is familiar with that story okay. about interracial marriage in the U.S. Okay. Well, um, apart from the fact that one just didn't do it, as I explained from my uh, childhood birthday party and, and my dateless career at Stanford, um, the state of Virginia and probably other states had laws that forbid interracial marriages. And uh, um, this uh, couple uh, defied the law and they got married and they got arrested and the, that produced the lawsuit Loving versus the state of Virginia and it went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court which declared uh, the Virginia law unconstitutional. And with that story makes me think about like how despite the you know all the, like the that a law system like law and order um, setting precedent is such a key um, vehicle for us to advance issues because now interracial marriage um, is more popular, is, uh, has advanced since, you know, when you were in Stanford and that was around um, the 60s? I, I went to Stanford 59 to 63. Si okay. Um, so, so that is... Um, that reminds me of other places around the world where there's no venue for women or men who want to marry from other, um, you know, religions or different races. Like in the Middle East, um, like you, you're ruled not by that, you're by the culture or by the religious laws. Um, and so, it's, so what's your thoughts on the law and order system in the U.S. and like why is that is important? Uh, for us to capitalize on to advance um, social justice issues. Well, we we are we are a country of laws, and uh, I'm a lawyer, so obviously I believe in it, and uh, and I see that as a, a a peaceful way of trying to change the world and change uh, conditions. Absolutely, and we recently just uh, passed the law on um, the the rights for the LGBT community to have. Um, um, no discrimination in the workplace um, at that a was time. Stunning. <laughs> stunning. Yeah. Can you tell us the significance of the voting on on that legislation? Um, the, well, the significance is that that uh, the LGBT community is now uh, entitled to the same rights as the rest of us minorities. <laughs> Uh, but the real significance is that it came out of this court that has, a, if, if you want to classify them, four liberals and five conservatives. And so it should have been a 5-4 decision uh, denying uh, LGBT community their rights. And instead, it was a 6-3. And in our legal world, when something's a 5-4 decision, if you won, you'll take it because any win is a win. But it's, uh, it's just there on the edge but anytime you get anything from a 6-3 to 7-2 to unanimous, uh, you have got a, a really serious decision that's going to take a while to get overturned, if ever. Uh, and so the fact that two conservatives went over uh, to the other side is stunning. And I'm sure, that, I'm sure the community was just as surprised as anybody. Yeah, and it, it goes to show that um, we've made a lot of progress. But going back to Stanford, um, so you were uh, part of a, a friend, like again, uh, friends and how you've learned about racism through friends. So you were part, tell us about your experience with your tr trio. Um, oh. <laughs> okay. Um, it, 
most of most of you know some some people will get discriminated against when they, someone doesn't give them a job or doesn't rent them a house but my 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 experiences have been more heartbreaking because they've been more personal and, and this one is perhaps the most personal um, I said there were two other black girls in, in my entering class and they all lived in the same dorm. And I came to know one of them really well. We became best friends, spent a lot of time on weekends with her family. I'm still connected with them today. And she had a roommate who, who was white and they were best friends. Uh, over time, the three of us became really best friends. And in our sophomore year, we were together all the time. We took not all, but several classes together. We studied together. We'd be walking along the quad together. And uh, when my French teacher would pass us, sometimes he would refer to us as les trois mousquetaires. And uh, um, it, was, it was a wonderful college, intense friendship. Well, the white female was majoring in Spanish and she got admitted to study in Spain. And so she was going to study there for her third year and depart by boat from New York in the summer before her third year. I was back east that summer working and I said, well, I'll come down to the pier and say goodbye to you. And that's what I did. Um, and I found her in, in the midst of all that crowd and, and chaos. And, which, and I saw her from afar and she saw me and she raced over to me and she said, Carolyn, Penny's parents are really racist. And Penny tells me if they see me talking to you, they'll yank her off the boat and she won't be able to go to Spain. So could you please leave? Um, so I straightened my shoulders, turned around and went and got in the car and shut the door and started crying the way I'd never cried before. And while I was crying, a police officer came and tapped the window and said, ma'am, uh, you're parked, you need, you can can't park here anymore. And then he looked at my face and the tears and, and the nose running. And he, he says, ma'am, do you think you could move the car? So I dried my eyes and I moved the car. And uh, I went back home and I didn't tell anybody. I had enough self-preservation that I got up every day and I went to work and then I came home and I went into my room and shut the door and went to bed. And then when it was time for school to start in the fall, I went back to school. I uh, went to classes, did my studying, went, sit, stayed in my room and slept. Uh, one day, uh, the third party, the other colored girl, she received a letter from the, the white one and she uh, explaining what had happened and she came over and read it to me and we sat there and we cried together. Uh, eventually, I, just, I wanted to save myself and so I went to Stanford's um, clinic and I saw a shrink there for about six months and we patched me up and put me back on the road. So um, it's horrible. Um, after that, the pain of that experience stayed with you for years. Um, you've um, met with this person in re reunions at Stanford um, and y you haven't forgotten like about this Pain. Um, can you tell us how, tell us about your reunion together with, with that person? Okay, well, yeah, it was my 25th reunion. And um, at our class dinner that night, it was a buffet. I was standing in line when someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Carolyn, can I talk to you? And I turned around and it was the white female. And she, she said, we went aside and she, she told me that what she had done that day had haunted her all her life because she had betrayed someone that was so important to her and because she had betrayed me it worried her as a wife and a mother that she could do that to her husband or her children because she didn't know where that came from uh, but it had happened and and she came to say how sorry she was and so we stood there and we cried and uh, um, that was very good for both of us. So you went, so you went through kind of a, a healing, not just within yourself, but also trying to heal that relationship in a way, whatever you could heal. Um, yeah. Um, so fast forward, you ended up at Yale, um, mm -hmm. and your experience in Yale, you've learned about misogyny and discrimination against women. 
Uh, so tell us about your experience um, with that. And um, yeah, so how, tell us uh, the story of the example of your uh, running for elections, for example. Okay, well, um, but I wanna back up one second. Uh, but before I went to Yale, if any time something happened to me that wasn't fair or that was unexplainable, I would ask myself, has this happened because it's the color of my skin? I didn't realize till I got to Yale that actually I had two strikes against me and that out here in the world, particularly the legal world in the 60s, uh, it was not a very good idea to be a woman wanting to be a lawyer. So I learned that first off uh, from one of my teachers who told me, uh, it's not good enough that you get A's, you're gonna have to do better. Uh, but the story that you're remembering had to do with our uh, student body association. I decided uh, in my second year that I would run to be president of the association for the third year. Um, and the guy who was then the president of the association told me uh, to my face that uh, he was going to campaign against me and buy and uh, support another candidate because he, in this all predominantly male law school, he didn't think that a female could adequately represent them. So uh, uh, he did try to promote a, a candidate, uh, but I owed my election to one of the other competing candidates who was very politically savvy and he saw that if we both ran, we would probably split the vote that people who supported us were similar. And so he withdrew and uh, I did get elected. That's phenomenal. Um, um... What, so he's your friend, um, he's, what's his name? Dave Patinsky. Dave. So mm -hmm. thank you, Dave. I don't know if you're watching, but thank yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, Dave is still practicing law back in <laughs> Philadelphia. Thank you. Um, uh, we want more Daves in the world, I guess. You know, people who are selfless and sometimes leadership is to step down, not always to be in the leading seat. Um, Okay, so another thing was that as a woman, like rec like finding a job afterwards. So you graduated and it seemed that, like tell us how did you experience misogyny in, in finding a job? Well, uh, it was true that um, it was harder to be a black female lawyer than a black male lawyer. And when my class was ready to graduate, the seven black males all had jobs, whereas all the women either had no job or had to do something creative to get themselves a job. Mm -hmm. um, I, I applied, to, I remember applying to one law firm from San Francisco and the man foolishly said, well, we're really interested in you, but our clients wouldn't be. And <laughs> I took that, I, I went right to the dean and told the dean and the dean said, uh, dean uh, said, well, I'll be writing to them. They're not welcome at our school. So he wrote to them and complained, and of course they wrote back and said there must have been some misunderstanding, uh, but they they got the message, and I'm sure that uh, um, that the next time they came, that someone more savvy kept his mouth shut about who he was interested in or not. Me, I did not get a job, and so I had spent the summer before uh, also not getting a summer job. I had spent that summer as a group leader of high school and college students for a summer exchange in Trieste, Italy. Uh, and once I saw I wasn't going to have a job immediately after law school, I realized it was a great time to live my dream of living abroad for a year or more. So um, that I went- Tell us about your Italy experience. Okay, all right. So uh, I, I went back and I lived with the family that I lived with the year before and I worked as an interpreter and translator for several companies in Trieste. And by then um, I was actually nicely fluent in Italian. Um, but then the nice part about being in Trieste, well, so many nice things, but the story that's interesting here is that I was the first person of color the people in Trieste had ever seen back in the 60s. And I was a novelty, so to speak, but in a good way, they loved my living there. They loved that I could speak Italian. 
uh, and everybody knew my name. And anytime I went into any kind of store, they recognized me right away. Their eyes lit up. They greeted me in Italian and we had a little chat and I was having a nice, a nice, cozy, uh, nice, cozy life there, a happy life. That's striking for me because you, the, for the same reason, y you were kind of discriminated against and treated badly in, in the US. And for the exact same reason, which is the, your color, um, you were celebrated and you were um, adored by the, your community in Italy. So if I wonder what made you, but still you decided to go back to the U.S. So I wonder why would you go back to the U.S. when you are adored in Italy? Because what was I'm, going on, on the at the time? I went home because I'm an American. I went home in 1967 because America was protesting. America was burning. And I just felt I needed to be home. At the time, uh, the civil rights movements was um, very active and Martin Luther King was spearheading that um, um, rhetoric and our dialogue uh, uh, around civil rights. Um, and his death specifically impacted you when you came back, you wanted to be part of the civil rights movements um, and you wanted to protest and you were actively protesting. Um, and then his death, impacted you and your career choices. So can you tell us about the experience of you witnessing Martin Luther King death? So I came home in uh, 67, November of 67, studied for the California bar. And then while waiting for the results, I sent out letters to lots of law firms all along the uh, California, uh, looking for a job as a contracts lawyer in the law firm. I on the day that I, and I was and I had a in the meantime I was working for Kelly girl just to uh, put food on the table and in the meantime Martin Luther King was killed and so one day I didn't go to work and I sat home and watched his funeral on TV and it was it was really very moving it was emotional and sitting there watching it I thought of something he had once said if you don't have anything worth dying for you don't have anything worth living for and at, and at that moment, it hit me that I didn't have anything worth dying for. Um, and I had an emotional reaction. Suddenly, I felt this heavy weight on my chest. I describe it as a, a Mack truck sitting on my chest. And it was so heavy, I could barely breathe. And I carried that around for two or three days. And then I thought, I'm going to be a legal services attorney. And the Mack truck went away. So I got a job. I had, uh, with the Legal Aid Society of Alameda County in Oakland, and I was a poverty lawyer. And um, tell us, I, you could you could have had a higher paying job, but you chose to do um, law for people who are poor. And why? How? Tell us um, about like a story from that time that stuck with you, like helping um, people who are voiceless and being their voice at the time. There were so many of them, <laughs> and, and I, it, it's, and they had so many problems due so uh, so much to the their not having any money. I mean, it affects your housing, it affects your being able to pay your rent, then it affects your losing your housing, it affects whether you have any medical benefits, it affects uh, what you're eating, it affects if your kids then whether or not you can focus on school. Uh, then, of course, if, if someone was foolish enough to give you a credit card, uh, you're usually going to overspend it because you don't have any money. And then, uh, then the uh, creditors are going to go after you. And if you happen to have a s small job, you're gonna, your wages will be garnished. And then you'll be ready for bankruptcy. And it's, it's just this, uh, this straight line <laughs> uh, that you can't get out of. Yeah. And uh, so poverty basically... You've learned fast that poverty is something you can't get out of um, without help, probably, for most likely, if you're poor, it's, it's, it's really hard to get out of poverty. Um, someone has to break the chain. Yeah. And so, um, fast forward, you ended up in Alaska um, as a, a human rights lawyer. 
What was your role there in Alaska? Um, in the 1970s, they were constructing an oil pipeline in Alaska, and it was a big deal, and it produced a lot of well-paying jobs. And many people went up north looking for a job on the pipeline, whether if you could make a bed, if you could cook, if you could roof, if you could weld, if you could drive a car, if you could get dispatched to the pipeline construction, you could make enough money to change your life. I mean, people saved their money and bought the farm or put themselves through college. It was a big deal. However, um, women and minorities didn't feel they were getting dispatched to these jobs equally, and they started uh, filing a lot of complaints with the State Commissioner for Human Rights, my, my first uh, job assignment. And uh, I, I ended up litigating a lot of those cases. And it, was, uh, it was fun being a lawyer litigating these cases because uh, most of them had already been decided, the issues had already been decided in the lower 48, so I often had precedent. And so I just got to go stand before the Alaska Supreme Court and uh, field their questions and have a good time and win a lawsuit. And you won a lot of them for women. Uh, previously, the poor too. What, do you remember a, a lawsuit that you won for your, um, for, the, um, for your job in California? Oh, yeah. Um, so my first three years, I, I was in a neighborhood office and I just represented uh, uh, local people in the neighborhood who came in with their individual problems. But our, our legal aid society realized that we had a little, very little staff, very little money, and we, and we weren't breaking the cycles uh, uh, going forward that way. So they created a special unit, a class action unit, and they were going to identify issues that would have an impact on a lot of people rather than just one person. And that way, if we got a favorable decision, uh, more than one person would benefit. Uh, one of the case that I remember most is a case against the Oakland Police Department. They had height and uh, strength and agility and weight requirements that discriminated against women and Asians and Hispanics. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I brought that lawsuit and they were not able to justify uh, the restrictions. And so we got that victory in the California appellate court system and they did not take it to the California Supreme Court. Mm. Speaking of presidents and, um, and later at the same time going, like when you were in Alaska, at the, around that time, uh, women approved, uh, not Rotary approved women to be part of, uh, allowed women to be part of um, their membership. So mm -hmm. can you tell us how about how you joined Rotary and the significance of allowing women to join Rotary for you? Well, I like to call myself the reluctant Rotarian. Uh, the US Supreme Court on the first Monday in May in 1987, it handed down a ruling that in the case of Rotary International versus the Rotary Club of Duarte, California. And the court said in that ruling that in California, Rotary clubs cannot exclude women from membership on the basis of their gender. That was the ruling and it really only affected California, but there were two things that weren't widely known. One was that the RI board had decided if they lost this lawsuit, they were gonna throw in the towel in America because they didn't wanna to have to litigate 49 other lawsuits. <laughs> the other thing is that the Rotarians in the other 49 states didn't understand that this case only applied to California. And so the day after the lawsuit, my friend Manuel called me up and said, I wanna take you to lunch at Anchor Cease Rotary tomorrow. And I said, thank you, Manuel, but no thank you. I'm 40 plus and I've carried the torch long enough. I'm tired, it's someone else's turn. I don't feel like going where I'm not wanted. And he kept saying, Carolyn, you, you know, that's not true. And you're such a community activist and you'll get so much support. I said, no, thank you. Manuel called me five Tuesdays in a row. <laughs> that if I didn't go to lunch with Manuel, he wasn't gonna leave me alone. No. So I went. And as soon as I walked through the door at the Anchorage Hilton, two guys I knew in my business world looked up at me and said, Carolyn, hi. And then after the meeting, several guys came over and said, well, thank you for coming. You think you might be interested in joining Rotary? Do come back. And the rest, as they say, is history. So that's the day you joined Rotary. When was the day that you felt you were a true Rotarian? 
the same year, 87, the day before Thanksgiving, again, a Wednesday, I had read in the Anchorage Daily News that the Salvation Army was going to have a hard time serving its turkey dinner the next day because there was a shortage of turkeys. So I took in the article, read it at the lunch meeting and said, uh, I'll pass the hat. If you give me some money, I'll go to Costco and buy the turkeys and deliver them right away. And in the space of time it took for the hat to go around, we had $300 and off I went and bought the turkeys. But I was so taken by this response in, in supporting my idea and also trusting me to walk off with the $300. And um, I, so that's when you did your first service project, I assume that's, but that's only the start, Carolyn. Later on, you did endless service projects uh, that got you really um, known and you were not trying to be known, you were just trying to help people. And so um, tell us about, I honestly haven't talked to you about this, but I wanna know about it. Like you've been to Russia 35 times mm -hmm. and you won an award for service above self for volunteering to be a teacher for underprivileged children. Do you remember, like, can you share with us a little bit about your service projects in Russia and the significance of you, like, educating the underprivileged children? Like, tell us the story about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I have been to Russia about 35 times, and as five of those times, I was a rotary volunteer. Um, and the first, the, the, originally, I got involved in service projects as I, just before I became a district governor. Uh, I was with a team of Rotarians. We'd gone to Eastern Russia to charter five new clubs. And when I got to Tomsk, Russia, my host asked me if I could go with him to the hospital to see their new club's first project. Turned out their first project was to help children who had leukemia and other forms of cancer. Uh, and while these doctors had a plan for fighting the cancer, the hospitals hadn't received their stipend from the federal government for more than a year. So because they couldn't buy the chemo medicine, they couldn't treat the kids. Well, I, I saw that story and then I went that night to the charter ceremony and when I had a few minutes to speak, I told everyone what I'd seen. And after the ceremony, other Russians came up and they told me about other instances where children in Russia uh, were in crises. They were in crises because they were dying, because they were undereducated, they were being abandoned by parents who couldn't take care of them, they were being sold for two bottles of vodka. Um, what, anything, any crisis you can name, uh, the whole country was having trouble surviving and the, the kids were at the bottom of the food chain and they were the biggest victims and the voiceless victims. So as a result of that little bit of information, I came back home uh, and said to, to our district, let's try and do a project to help the kids in Russia. And we called it the Children of Russia Project. And uh, we, uh, we announced it and we said, we're looking for $2,500 contributions from clubs or districts. We're gonna put package four of them together and we're gonna sponsor a project. I told the 22 clubs in Eastern Russia to submit at least one proposal to help children in Eastern Russia. And uh, by the time we finished, we had uh, enough money from 132 clubs uh, from five districts, as well as the foundation money, it was over $620,000. And we sponsored 30 projects in 22 communities everything from medical equipment to uh, hearing for, uh, equipment for the hearing impaired to sewing machines for uh, vocational training for developmentally delayed and the chemo medicine for the kids in Tomsk. Uh, uh, Tomsk did two projects and one of them was with an orphanage and, and I eventually went back to that orphanage to visit and became very attached to the orphanage and the children. And for about 10 years, my club actually sponsored that orphanage. And the pictures you just saw a minute ago represent uh, some little children that I met then. And they are now grown today and live in the state of Washington. Wow. So there they are. So that's how did, you, how did you meet them? Like, can you like you met them as kid, children? I mean, you've helped many children. So how did you? Are you in contact with 
Uh, how do you became in contact with them? Um, well, you know, um, all, all district governors have a rotary business card and we always have our photo on it. And when I would travel in Russia and I would go to the orphanages, if I didn't have any gifts or anything, I would give them my card. And it was a big deal to them. It was a picture and I was in my bright red jacket and it has my name on it, my phone number and my email address. And so when they got adopted, um, they wanted to get in touch with me. Mm -hmm. And so I got a message from their adopting family and I said, gee, they were, because they're in the state of Washington, I come that way sometimes to speak at Rotary Clubs, maybe we can get together. And so we did. Wow. You know. um, so that impact of the projects of Rotary in Russia, uh, can you estimate like the number of children that you think you've helped? Like there's all these projects that are sustainable and they continue to help children like not once, but continually. So. Can you ask, like thousands? It's definitely thousands, but it's incalculable. I mean, this, let's take, for example, that orphanage. That orphanage had 110 kids in it. So there were, it's, you had a baseline of 110. Uh, any, any given year, 10 or 15 might be adopted or age out, and you add another. And uh, we were doing our project with them for, for 10 years. Uh, one of the things we bought them was a school bus because they had to go about two or three miles in the Siberian winter and snow on foot to get to their school. Mm -hmm. uh, our bus continued their education. Then for the, uh, in, it was Yelizava where we gave the, we gave, I think it was about 10 sewing machines and they had a lot of children that, that were developmentally delayed but teachable uh, with the right skills. And so they had like six months to a year of training uh, to learn how to sew. Mm -hmm. So back to your Rotary Club, so the impact is, like you said, it's hard to calculate. And this is, what's uh, this? <laughs> what's this? Um, so so the, the Rotary Club of Tomsk, a very savvy uh, club, uh, they, they, uh, decided that they wanted to nominate me uh, for the uh, Volunteer of the Year that is awarded out of Moscow uh, by the Russian Children's uh, fund and it's an NGO for all of Russia uh, and there were 149 nominations and uh, you can't read it but it says I'm the one. <laughs> well um, this is beautiful because it just shows that uh, people can connect um, through service and we are unified in our spirit for to serve others and help others. Um, so, Carolyn, back to your uh, fundraising that started before Thanksgiving. Now, I believe it has grown. So, how much money um, they've raised, um, the last you can remember, it started with a few hundred dollars, and now I think it's up to thousands of dollars. What? But, like, the fund, like, you started a fundraising for um, projects, like the hat. Like, I think you've raised $35,000. Oh, oh I, I think you're probably talking about my club. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, when I first joined my club, actually, when I first joined my club, they had a deficit in their budget. Um, but one of the things they wanted to do, like every good club, was to contribute to the Rotary Foundation and preferably um, do something significant in Foundation Month, which is November. Uh, I, I, one year, I volunteered to put on a silent auction for them. They had never done a silent auction or any kind of auction. I had done them previously for some political candidates. And so we did our first one uh, at a Rotary meeting. Instead of the meeting, we just had a silent auction. And I remember people came 15 or 20 minutes early bringing items. It was, it was quite chaotic, but we, we raised about five or $6,000 that first time. And they were so impressed with raising so much so quickly that uh, the annual auction, both live and, uh, and silent, is now a, a, a staple of our fundraising activities. And now it's an evening event with dinner and entertainment and oral auction and, and lots of other uh, things happening on the side. And we will we'll raise 30 to 35,000, but other people are now in charge. I handed off the torch a few decades ago. So, um, so this is all the stuff you've been doing in Rotary. 
and uh, then you get noticed by the RI president. Um, who was the president who in, invited you to the um, to join the Rotary Foundation? And what's the story about you joining um, the, to be the first woman in the world to be the first woman trustee in Rotary? Okay. Well, the the, the way it goes uh, uh, at the Rotary uh, International level is that the president elect uh, proposes individuals for all kinds of committees and and as well as to serve as trustees and uh, so it the president elect was Carl Willem Stenhammer of Sweden mm -hmm. and he proposed my name I was one of three names that he sent up to the board for uh, to serve on the uh, foundation in the subsequent following year uh, um, so I, I owe I owe the rest of my rotary career so to speak to Carl Willem Stenhammer who um, he, one of his goals was to help women rise through the ranks in Rotary. And he understood that that doesn't happen unless you've got a good Rotary resume above the district level. And the only way that's going to happen is through some of these appointments at for RI committees. So his year, uh, well, I remember his year, he, he, he named 10 women as international training leaders to train incoming district governors. That was the largest number ever at that time. And he in, submitted my name to be a trustee. Oh, I love that picture. You see that picture with all those men there? <laughs> Every year at the end of the year, take an, a picture, an annual photo of the trustees and a separate one of the directors. That is the first year that there's a female face in a picture. Well, I have three more. I have three more like that because I was a trustee for four years, but that's year number one. Very interesting. So the RI president, Carl, um, um, he was intentional about elevating women in Rotary, and therefore we had an increase in numbers of women in leadership. And um, so basically he was trying to change the culture in Rotary by setting a policy or May, I don't know if it's official, but it was his internal policy, maybe, um, and acted accordingly. And, and therefore, we have uh, you as a, a very valuable leader that we needed in Rotary. Other, it would be a loss for Rotary not to have Carolyn and all the other beautiful women out there who are leading change. Um, so Carolyn, after Rotary, um, like this is kind of the Rotary story. We've learned about your um, kind of where you came from, all the stuff you've been through. Uh, fast forward to our current events and today, like with what happened um, it would, to George Floyd and the protests, and what's your thoughts given that you've been facing racism long time ago and you've seen the civil rights movements? How, do you think we've made progress? Mm -hmm. um. It's hard to believe it's only been three weeks. So much has happened in, in the, the three plus weeks. But um, when, when George Floyd was murdered right in front of our eyes, the first thing I thought was, oh, expletive. I won't tell you which one I said. You'll probably guess wrong. But anyway, um, I thought nothing's changed. I remember, I remember when Rosa Parks got on a bus and sat in the front seat, a uh, tired black lady after a long, hard day. And when the white man got on the bus and wanted to claim his rights to that seat, she refused to move. And that, that refusal led to the Montgomery boy, bus boycott and eventually uh, a, a decision by the uh, Supreme Court that uh, segregated busing was unconstitutional. And then there were those, those African-American students that uh, sat in at a Woolworths lunch counter to integrate it, and they got, they got arrested. But uh, that protest led to a lot of businesses changing their policies. And, and then, of course, there was Martin Luther King and his group that walked 40, 54 miles in five days from Selma to Montgomery to protest uh, the fact that Blacks weren't allowed to, to vote. And that resulted in the Voting Rights Act. I remember all of those things. And now, 50 years later, I thought, nothing's changed. 
The trouble is, after I thought that, and I kept watching the TV every day and what's going on, I realized that, yeah, there is something significantly different about what I'm watching and reading. And it was, it was you listening to me, white people. <laughs> I want to thank you, because what I saw was suddenly in those protests, you would see as many whites as you would see blacks. I saw a protest where the whites outnumbered the blacks. I saw a protest where a group of middle-aged white women linked their arms and stood in front of the protesters and facing the line of policemen on the other side as a barrier to protect them. Uh, I, I read about these six uh, teenage girls, black and white, who met over Facebook and decided they were going to honor Floyd and, and hold a protest. And depending on who did the counting, 10 to 20,000 people showed up for a peaceful protest. And then I read about this little girl in, in Ohio. She was only nine years old. She was white. And she says, I think it's wrong to kill black people. And if I can get it, why can't you? And I thought, oh my goodness, something has changed. And you know, my, my I always say about progress, it never happens as fast as the people who need it uh, and want it to happen. But it does happen and it is happening right now. And it's happening actually at a breakneck speed. If you think of the things that have happened in this past month, I mean, laws have been passed, uh, policies about chokeholds have been changed. Um, so it's it's clear it's clear from uh, experience that I've had in the last few weeks that there's still more work to be done, but it's also clear from everything I've read and watched and followed in the last four weeks that uh, we've come a long way. And for those of you out there uh, who don't share my skin color but who have been activists or want to be active, I thank you. Thanks, uh, Carolyn, for your sentiments. Um, I want to ask you now, Vic, your brains um, and your um, superior competence on legal issues about, in your opinion, on um, police reform. Like, um, how have you raised an issue for me that was really, you know, very enlightening about opinion of what could change um, immediately that could at least fix um, the issue um, or nudge the issue towards a good, a good trajectory. So can you share with us your legal opinion on that? I will, um, and, I'm, and I'm going to be very reflective and careful as I give you my answer because I don't want anybody to read anything into it but what I'm actually saying. Okay, there is an inherent conflict of interest um, in, in law reform that doesn't seem to be recognized. And that's what I want to talk about. Not the people, uh, because a lot of these people who are uh, a victim of this conflict are good people and well-meaning and trying to do their job. But the way this, the setup is, they have got a conflict. Here, here it is. In the, in the world of law enforcement, there is a team that protects us and enforces the law. One half of the team are the police men and women. They try to prevent law breaking, they try and catch lawbreakers, and then they try and, and pull together the evidence to demonstrate that the individual was actually uh, breaking the law and is worthy of paying the price for that. A at some point, that information goes to the other member of the team, that's a district attorney. And the district attorney's job is to evaluate the evidence, determine if there's enough there to go forward, and eventually, if there is, to prosecute the individual and try and get a conviction, okay? If a police officer is someone who is accused of wrongdoing, as we're seeing right now in Atlanta and Minneapolis, that district attorney the other half of the team is given the job of prosecuting the partner. And that's a conflict. And, and you can have the best DAs in the world, the most honorable, the most ethical there are. They shouldn't be put in that position. Yeah. And that is uh, highlights 
the issue of police accountability, that's the issue that everyone is protesting, that they say no peace, no justice, no justice, no peace. And it, and it really sheds the lights like why the, the police who are involved in wrongdoing, they're not being accountable. Uh, we don't have accountability that is clear. Um, and maybe that's probably part of why this is a problem. Uh, can you, do you have other thoughts on that, Carolyn? Well, I mean, the, the most immediate one is that in situations where a police officer is going to be charged or is being accused of committing crimes, especially serious felonies, I, I think that uh, either the state attorney general or a special prosecutor should be named to handle the case. And uh, it, will, it, it, it will give everybody more confidence and as I say, it will take the DAs out of what's an untenable role. And now we have a huge issue um, that is that people don't trust police. Um, and how do you, how are your thoughts on that in in a country that is has thrived and progressed and evolved because of law and order? Um, there are rhetoric calling for police abolition. Um, what's your thoughts? And if you have a message also for the police officers out there, um, if you wanna share anything to them. Okay. Well, I, I do not support abolishing uh, police. Um, I think we need them. And I think in general, they protect us. And I think that mainly they are good. They have a few, they, I mean, they're just a group. They don't walk on water any more than any of us do, Rotarians or police or anybody else. Um, there's always going to be a couple of rogues or they say a couple of bad apples. Uh, but unfortunately for the police, their rogues and bad apples don't get called to account as often as the rest of us do. And it's making police, the whole police force look bad and the rest of you don't deserve that. Um, I appreciate everything you've done and I want you around. I want you to be happy at your job. I want you to be proud of what you're doing uh, and I want us to respect you and I want you to feel respected. Uh, but if, if, if the, the, trust, the trust will come when it, there, it's evident that there can be some accountability and that uh, people are not allowed to continue making mistakes. I mean, some of these stories they tell about uh, the, a rogue officer is that they've got multitude complaints. Chauvin, the man in Minneapolis, he had 17 complaints and he was only found wrong once. I guess you could say, well, maybe people file, you know, false complaints, uh, but that's a lot of complaints. And Carolyn, I can't agree with you more. Um, as as a, a person from the Middle East, as a Muslim, I am familiar with Islamophobia. And it is because people attach, and I feel that um, I shouldn't be called um, a terrorist because of the acts of a few. Um, I'm nothing like ISIS or um, people who are committing crimes in name of religion or culture. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way, I was thinking, reflecting on this and thinking, now I feel like we're having police phobia in the, in, in the US. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how is that helping anything. Um, is, do you think um, media played a role in perpetuating a police phobia uh, attitude in, in the US and around the world? Well, I mean, certainly we learn about it through the media. Uh, we learn a lot of things through the media. Um, I mean, it, it's in part, it's in part what else we know and, and how, we, how we see the world. So if, if, we are, if we already have a dim view of the police and then you're bombarded with all these stories, it reinforces what you think. Mm -hmm. If you start out thinking that uh, they're a good group of men and women with a few bad apples, then you evaluate the new bad apple and as an individual rather than as a group. Absolutely. And that if we are serious about solutions, we need to work together as a community. I love what you said earlier. You said that racism is not only a black 
um, issue, it's an American issue. And, and, I, and I add to this, it's a humanitarian issue. Um, and so for us to provide solutions and pro evolve this issue in the right direction, we need to be able to work together. And working together starts by reason and understanding and fear and, um, and mistrust is, is, is only symptoms of uh, a broken relationship. And I feel that we as a community should come together and assess the problem and uh, start with really looking at the reasons behind the problems and work together. And I want to add one other thing. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we ask too much of uh, most police forces in that, um, for example, if, if you've got a person with a mental health issue who is acting out, your first thought is to dial 911 and you get a law enforcement person sent to deal with a mental health issue. And law enforcement people were trained to enforce the law. I mean, I, I guess I'd ha they'd have to tell me if they sit in class and, and, and have a class to, to identify when someone's got a mental health issue and how you spot it and how you respond to them. Uh, and then, for example, uh, the case, the Atlanta one, that, that man was drunk. At, at least the kid who called, made the phone call said he seems inebriated. They got there, they gave him a, a test. It seemed that he failed it. Uh, in some communities, wh when you think somebody's drunk, you have the community health patrol come out. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have a cop messing with it when they could be solving a burglary or, or something else. Uh, plus, and, and, you, and you'll have a person, one who won't be carrying a taser gun uh, when you have a, a mental health person come out. Um, and, and, they, and they will recognize, for example, the reactions of, of an inebriated person. I mean, when, when you've had too much to drink, you're not necessarily the most rational, passive, obedient person. Some people are, and some people aren't. Uh, and if it had been a community uh, patrol person rather than a police officer, the reaction would have been different with that guy. Who knows, maybe they would have just given him a ride home and taken his car keys. Absolutely, I love this, con like shedding light on uh, violence escalation or police escalation when it's not needed. Um, so if we go back to the George Floyd's uh, case, like you said, he was called for, like it's known, he was, uh, the police was called for his $20 bill, uh, fraud, you know, fraudulent on that. And they send four police officers to address that. Um, and they don't expect this to escalate. Um, it's, so what do you, so how do you think they could have handled it differently? Um, well, that, that definitely was a potential crime. Um, I don't think it needed four people. I mean, someone calls in and says, I think he's trying to pass a counterfeit $20 bill. You didn't need to take four officers off the street to take care of that. Yeah. I, I would have taken fewer. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't know if you give him a citation or or what. But he, he claimed he claimed he had claustrophobia and he didn't want to be put in the back of the car. And I'm sure there are people who might claim that who don't have claustrophobia. And how is a police officer to know? Uh, but I, I definitely I, I I think it's an overwhelming optic of power when you have four police officers. Absolutely. Last question before we move to our Q and A. You have many Q and As. Uh, what can Rotarians play, how can Rotarians play a role in um, leading on um, racial justice? Because racial justice is the core of peace. Like um, Nelson Mandela is a recognized peace leader for his reform and leading his country um, beyond racism. Um, and, and there's endless examples of how race is a, an element to perpetuate conflict. And Rotary's peace area focus, um, one of Rotary's areas of focus is peace. Um, so peace and race are intertwined, especially that human rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, states that article too, that everyone is, um, has the rights 
um, equally regardless of their race. So, so Rotary has a responsibility and what do you think they can do, uh, Carolyn, from your point of view? Um, well, for one thing, it would be good if Rotary understood that there isn't going to be peace as long as there is racism. Mm -hmm. And Rotary has already embraced the fact that we're supposed to be promoting peace and world understanding. And so if, if, if they can swallow the idea that racism is, is, is along the path to peace, and if you don't address it, there will never be peace. Think of South Africa. I mean, uh, they, they, uh, they were torn apart for decades uh, because of racism. So, so that's the beginning. And that can happen at all levels. Just it could happen with one simple Rotary Club deciding we get it. It would be nice if it happened at the top level with an RI president and, and 17 directors saying we get it and here's what we're going to do about it. Uh, but you know, a lot of good things in Rotary have start, started at the club level and worked their way up and gotten somebody's attention. Wow, I mean that alone, Carolyn, reminds me of your story. You said, if is it to be, it is up to me. And you're saying to the clubs, don't wait on your presidents to take a stand and be on the right side of history. Um, we are a grassroots movement. A club can take leadership. And so I urge you um, all to lead on making the right changes and uh, decisions. So here's some actions that, creative actions that the Rotarian Action Group for Peace, uh, not the Together for Peace and uh, uh, for this season finale, we've been uh, trying to promote that Rotary Clubs has an opportunity right now to dedicate funds to, um, especially for indigenous black people, people of color, to support entrepreneurs or um, give microloans to people who are suffering from racism. Um, empower women who are exposed to racism, uh, fund students, um, promising students who don't have access to opportunity because of systems in place that is not in their favor. Um, continue to educate yourself about the histories of people of color and um, indigenous people and black people and where their, um, you know, um, struggle comes from. And because it is important, just like we have to identify the need, the community need to start a water well. Um, if people don't have access to clean water, we wouldn't know that they need clean water. In the same way, we need to know about the history of uh, racism to know how we can help, to be informed in helping. I want you to share this episode um, and uh, with of Carolyn, previously Tyrone, both of them were, on, were honored to have their voices on this uh, special season, um, special um, episodes uh, for the season finale of Together for Peace. Please share them with your friends and family and Rotary Network because we need to raise awareness and it's the best thing to hear it from leaders um, of people of color and black people. Um, support to organization working on activism and um, after the after this meeting, uh, we will be sending you uh, a recording from Carolyn, um, where we've asked him and she asked her and she generously gave us her time and attention. Um, please listen to Carolyn's statement and call to action and uh, share it with your Rotary Club. You can start there. Um, we are honored to have uh, the phenomenal Carolyn here uh, sharing that statement through the Together for Peace. So thank you. So now. I'm sorry for everyone waiting on the Q&A. Here we go. Uh, by the way, I've received a comment, Carolyn, that I can't ignore. It's from Greg uh, Gormos, um, a dear friend of mine. And he says, Carolyn, we need you as the president of RI. It is time. So that's big pressure on you. <laughs> that's not going to happen, but I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> OK. So from Greg, he says, to address institutional and unconscious racism and discrimination, U.S. universities are finally addressing symbols, example, Confederate statues, 
a true example, a segregationist leader who changed um, and later led major efforts for integration is treated the same as a Confederate leader. His question, what are appropriate criteria for a fair process for institutions to remove such symbols? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to have that answer off the top of my head, huh? Um, I, I, I guess I'd have to say one is uh, what, what, what are, who is the individual that's the subject of, of this removal? I mean, what, what, what did they do? And if it's something that, that um, has passed its time and has passed its, its uh, meaningfulness or is contrary to what we think are our values today, then, then, it's, then you remove it. And, it's pro and it's a, I'm, surely it's a subjective decision, unless you're gonna say, if they murdered someone, they're gone, right? Or if, if they own slaves, they're gone. Those are, those are quite factual, but there may be other people whose patterns aren't are as easy to identify. Uh, it's probably gonna be on a case by case basis. And it, it's gonna also be a part of the community. Uh, the, it may not be nationally that it would, the statue would be removed, but in that particular community, um, that's their community values have changed and it's no longer there. It's no longer appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, so here I have, a question from Jane, she's asking, which has caused you more um, trouble during your life, being a woman or being black? Um, I guess personally, being a woman. I, um, I mean, I've heard so many stories of, of things that have happened to black people and they haven't happened to me. I, I try, sometimes I feel guilty that you know this this is my skin color but somehow i sort of avoided or, or slipped by and didn't and didn't get, i wasn't the subject of the things that other people have been the subject of or repeatedly the subject of i mean for, for one thing for starters i'm not male i am so glad you know that my i had daughters and not sons because um it's scary being a parent of a black male child because they're the ones who are seen as a threat. They're the ones who, get, who are you, you're reading about that keep getting shot. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, so thank you for your serving. That's a question from um, Jane. Um, and thank you for helping Rotary get with the program, uh, knowing that women and all races have everything to contribute. I appreciate you. Okay, that was a comment from Jane who asked you that question. Okay, so now uh, a question from Bobby, or I'm not sure if my comment went through um, as it disappeared before I finished. Okay, I would like to thank Carolyn for sharing her pain and for her strength and courage in everything that she has done and continues to do. As a reluctant Rotarian, she has done wonderful things. Thank you, Bobby Redman, Rotary E Club of Greater Sydney, District 9685 Australia. Thank you, Bobby, for your sentiment. Thank you, Bobby. I love Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a question from Mark um, Harsbin. Um, so he says, some Rotarians insist that taking a stand on racism and particularly what is happening now is a political question that Rotarians should not be taking a position on. On the other hand, Rotary International has taken a position on racism, as has the UN, our partner. What do you think? Well, yes, Rotary actually did, uh, as a result of current events, issue a statement condemning what's happening and stating its position. Um, so it, it, it did deem it worthy of stating its position. If, if what you wanna do as a Rotarian is advocate for a change in a, a law, or advocate for a new law, then clearly that is, you know, a political activity, and you're going to have to decide if <laughs> I don't I don't know how you get around that and the fact that Rotary says we're not supposed to be engaged in political things. But there are lots of ways that we can address racism that don't have to involve uh, changing a law or getting a new law. Uh, all the, all the all the causes. Uh, or all the effects of racism you can address, like 
poor education. Think, think about uh, schools in minority communities. If you haven't visited a school in a minority community, try and do that because I guarantee you it'll look different from a school in a nice middle income suburb. Absolutely. Um, so you can make a difference as a Rotary Club by shoring up this school. Um, you know, direct your college scholarships to that to low income schools rather than to just the school in your middle income neighborhood where um, they've got more chances of, of making it on their own. Um, that it's that's that's the school where you can go read to the small children where you can give books to the kids where you can um my school my my club uh, for years now every month we have a teacher of the month and we they, we honor the teacher of the month and the student of the month they come to lunch and we explain why they got it and we give them each a check for two hundred dollars for the student we say we hope that you'll use this to apply for your you know future education, your college ap uh, applications. For the teacher, we ask them to use it for supplies in their classroom because all too often teachers wish they had something and they either do without or they spend their own money. I mean, so, so there are, if, if you, a ch a, uh, hunger is another issue. You can address hunger without it being political. So uh, yeah, um, there's no excuse for Rotarians uh, doing nothing if this is where they want to make a difference. And it is really for, it starts with the intention behind our service projects. So we need to be intentional and for us to be intentional, we need to be aware. That's why learning about the needs of people uh, of uh, suffering from racism and discrimination and minorities is important. And if it's not for us to help them, when we say service above self, who else would? And, and Carolyn's story in Russia is um, a fabulous example because the government in Russia could not help their own people. And Rotarians from, um, you know, from Alaska went there and helped the children because those were the people who needed help more than anything. And I, I remember Carolyn sharing with uh, me a story about the surgery, how um, mm -hmm. a child, yeah, can you tell us about that? Like that broke my heart. Well, I, I mentioned earlier the Children of Russia project and the numbers of ways we spent the money. One of them was uh, for a community of Blagoveshinks, which had a lot of children with serious heart issues that required expensive surgery. And it cost $10,000 or more to send them to Moscow for the surgery because um, the hospitals, local hospitals, didn't have the right equipment. So the doc, creative doctors came up with a solution. In order to perform this surgery, you have to dramatically lower the temperature of the children. And what they did was they created an ice bath and they would put the, ch the child in this ice bath as a means of lowering the child's temperature, body temperature. Then they'd perform the surgery and then they'd warm the child up. And uh, we used our money to buy the piece of equipment that would let them go forward without having to do ice baths anymore. Yeah, and and that's how returns can intervene, like um, Carolyn's teacher teaching her to believe in herself and not to listen to the nonsense. Maybe returns can um, is invest in training teachers in um, my in schools that suffer from a lack of funding, uh, and they usually exist in. Um, uh, neighborhoods that are poor and black and uh, and so those so when we start really think and analyze about the the gap of resources and the access to resources and rotary has resources and equity is an issue of access to resources we have power that we're responsible to act on and um, and we've always done that and so we need to just continue doing it with intention to solve racism um in that way in a humanitarian way um okay so now we have a question from james again he's saying what is something a rotary club can do to be a positive influence in the black lives matter movement so now he's asking about the movement and how rotarians can collide with that movement in a way um I, I'm, I'm not an, an authority on, on on this subject so um i, I really don't have 
a perfect answer for you. I, I, I would say, you know, find, find the local organization and reach out to them and ask that question. Yeah. Read and learn about their needs and see um, if you uh, would like to help them or not. That's your call. I agree. Um, so uh, the last question from our audience comes from David Newman. Uh, he says, in Winnipeg, police officers are called peace officers. Mm -hmm. Inspector in charge of the community policing unit, Bonnie Emerson, is a Rotary Peace Fellow and an Indigenous woman. Veteran staff sergeant in our Winnipeg Police Service has PhD in peace and conflict resolution. What are some best practices Rotary Clubs in USA are now using to help local police services become staffed with or trained to be skilled and disciplined peace officers who are peace literate human beings? <laughs> enough examples of maybe peace fellows that uh, were sponsored by Rotary. I know one in my Rotary Club mm -hmm. that we sponsored a police officer, yeah, there. And I, I, um, I, I had a chance a couple of times to visit our um, university in Thailand, Chula. It's, it's the, uh, the certificate peace program that, that Rotary sponsors. And uh, on both occasions, I met police officers. Uh, it, it, I, you know, wouldn't it be, it would really be cool if we just had <laughs> like one semester where it was just all police officers. Um, no. But... Uh, uh, they, I, it, it was, it was a good thing to see them there. They, they were, they, they were there because they wanted to be. They were there because they were being recognized by their, their police force for being worthy of the honor of, of having this additional training and, and of course, getting to see a little bit more of the world. But they also were there to take back what they learned to share and to, to train the police in their own force, and just to see them there with other peace builders of, of other vocations, just, just that alone made you feel good and, and know that you could make some differences. Yeah, uh, now that reminds me, Carolyn, of your visit to Portland when we planted a peace pool together mm -hmm. at the North Precinct, um, the police here, and that was an effort from Rotary Club to bridge the relationship uh, and mutual understanding between the police and the community, especially minorities and black people. Um, so do you want to comment on your, do you remember or, or like, do you have any sentiments about that experience, Galen? Um, I would like to see it more often. I, I, I mean, one way to, to maybe improve relations with police in our communities is to, to reach out to them and to find ways that we can uh, collaborate on on something that is important to both of us. Uh, you might ask them, you know, uh, how 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 can you help? How can we help to make your job easier? I visited a fire station one time a few years ago with several Rotarians, and we had dinner with the fire department, and we said to them the same question: Is there anything we can do uh, to help you? And and got an interest and got an answer and got an interesting answer. Their answer was. You know, you're going to see people standing on the streets, uh, homeless people, asking for money. He said, it, it really doesn't help our job if you give them money because they usually don't use it for the right things. But if you would give the money, say, to a shelter or to a food bank, then maybe you could make a change. Yeah. So, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, so uh, this is an example. The Peace Ball is a great bridger between the police and the Rotary Club. So if um, you know, uh, you can invest in communities, but also another way we can help is to, you know, get a peace ball and you can get that through the rag for peace. Please reach out to us and dedicate your peace ball to the police station and bridge peace conversations. Mm -hmm. That would be a great way. Start with the gift, um, of understanding and, um, um, a branch of, of peace. The, of the, the peace ball could be the branch, Olive, for peace with the police. Um, as peace builders, we have to engage in difficult conversations and take initiative. And you know, to, to add to this um, collaborating, um, there have twice now been peace conferences in Ontario, California, uh, organized by some very good peace-minded Rotarians. And I went to the first one, and one night at this very special dinner, 
they had invited as their guests a large number of local police officers just because they wanted to honor them for, for their contributions to the community. And I saw these officers and they looked so proud. They were, came in their uniforms, they had their chests held back and their, uh, their shoulders back and their chests forward and they were greeting each other. And uh, I, I, I could tell it meant a lot to them. You know, it's not often, uh, we, 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 we spend a lot of time pointing out the bad apples and not very much time saying thank you to the good ones. Yeah, we need to shed light on what works and, and enlarge that and, and invest in it. Carolyn, before we wrap it up, you are the product of a, a great family that instilled amazing values in you. And I know that your parents had an influence in you. So um, tell us what you value about your father. What's your father's name and uh, what you value about him? What Oh, my father's name uh, is Russell Octavius Jones. He was signed his name as Russell O. Jones. Um, my father and mother separated when I was two years old, but he really wanted to be my father. And I'm so lucky because I know of so many broken families that are truly broken. And I was fortunate that he and my mother both lived within about 20 miles of each other. So I got to see my father uh, as, as often as I wanted and as often as he and his family wanted. And, uh, and, and, and you know, he even apologized one time for not being a full-time father. Uh, it meant a lot to me and I, I can appreciate the kids that don't have that. Uh, he didn't graduate from high school. He, um, he was invited to leave high school when he was in the 10th or 11th grade and I don't know what he did, but he got on his high horse and he left. But he was a great, uh, he had a gr great way with his hands. He could repair cars, boats, and planes. The military loved him. Uh, he was in World War II and he was in the Korean encounter. And afterwards, uh, they kept writing him and asking him to come back and fix their planes. So, <laughs> so he basically saved uh, them from crashing by being a great handyman. <laughs> well, he was more than handy, yeah. I mean, you know, in another age, he could have probably gone to school and got an engineering degree or something. Wow. Yeah, fixing planes is a difficult thing. You don't want these things to fall with all gravity, and it's, it's difficult. Um, so, Carolyn, I want you to share with us um, the story about your mom. Tell us about your mom. My and mother? No. <laughs> Or like, maybe that's the question I usually ask at the end is like, what kind of impact you'd like to leave on the world? And you shared with us the story about your mom and how you came to life. Oh, okay. All right. Um, on a cold, dark, stormy night in 1939, my mother was uh, out riding my, with my father on the back of his motorcycle. They were double dating with his brother and wife who were following in a car. My father was bringing my mother home when they went over the crest of the hill down and, and to enter into Tarrytown. And my uncle was direct following too closely and uh, he hit the back of the motorcycle. My mother uh, flew into the air 20 feet, landed on her back and uh, was in and out of the hospital for a year. And uh, they told her that she would never have children. And uh, in January 9th, 1941, I was born. And she never ever had another child and she never did anything to prevent having another child. So I've always felt, well, making myself too self-important, I felt I was meant to be born and there had to be a reason for me to be here. And so my life has been spent in uh, finding the reason. And um, I love that story. I also love the story about your mom um, mm -hmm. suing her company. Uh, tell us why did she do that? Tell us how your mom character was like. She, you said she was a strong woman, she could do anything. Um, my, my, mother, uh, my mother graduated at, from high school at age 16. And uh, in those days, she went right away to work as a domestic cleaning other ladies' homes. In 1945, the New York Telephone Company decided it would hire uh, colored women. And so she was one of the first uh, telephone operators. 
She did that until about 1959. And by then though, the old injuries from that motorcycle um, so affected her back, she couldn't sit uh, eight hours a day. And so she switched and got a job as a clerk with the uh, Westchester County Social Services Agency. Uh, and she worked there until, um, I guess she was in her 60s. And uh, they um, started discriminating against her because of her age. Well, my mother had always been brought up not to make waves. I mean, those generations didn't. Um, it, it wasn't productive. And it often, if, if you spoke up, you usually paid for it. But something, I don't know what it was, but in her 60s, she decided she had enough and she wasn't gonna take it anymore. And she filed an age discrimination complaint with the New York State uh, Discrimination Commission and she won. I love this story, Carolyn, because um, it's like full circle that mm -hmm. your, great grand, uh, your great grandmother, as we started the conversation, was raped among many, many women in slavery and here your mom you witness you hear that as a kid and later on you see your mom suing her company because she believed in her rights and she was a feisty black mm -hmm. woman strong woman um and she didn't accept bullshit um and so and you yourself in the middle celebrating your humanity with all its shades with all its um dimensions whether you're a woman or a woman of color or a global citizen all of it uh, by being the best you can be and in the process also setting precedent for the weak and the voiceless um and the marginalized and and it's fascinating line or trend to look at because it shows the power of low and culture how they influence each other and how as a collective um, over time we've earned our rights and we set precedent for those rights to be respected and to evolve um, and I feel that like your you know you your your teacher inspired you to believe or and not just your teacher but also your upbringing that if it is to be it is up to me and listening to the protesters out there it's like they're saying if it is to be it's up to us um, we're not taking disrespect or violation of our rights and that's their cry their cry for justice for improving the lives of everybody regardless of their race gender or color um, do you have thoughts on that or do you disagree with me miss um, jones <laughs> <laughs> suddenly I'm Miss Jones after all of this. Um, no, no, I agree with you, and I think that I want to thank you for inviting me to speak today. And um, I'm 79. I'm trying to to move into my golden years. I'm not looking for any more fights. Um, and I would really appreciate it if you all would take up the cause of racism and give me a break. We will, Carolyn. We will. You've carried it enough. I mean, uh, you are to me also, I want to highlight like your story. Um, it's also a reminder, like we always think Martin Luther King was um, the, you know, he's a symbol of change, but he didn't do it all on his own. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the symbol of that struggle. And you were one of his soldiers waging peace because you chose to, uh, to protest, to, to echo that momentum. You took a stand in history and you were on the right side of history. So listening to Carolyn, listening to this, please stand on the right side of history, just like Carolyn asked in her statement. Um, Carolyn, I was absolutely honored to have your uh, heart and mind and spirit um, shared with all of us um, through our humble um, screen of Zoom at the time of uh, social isolation. But I, trust me, I was moved and I believe a lot of us were impacted by, by your powerful words. Um, and you've turned us into conscious human beings about an issue that we should pay more attention, more attention to. Um, 
do you have any other thoughts before I wrap this up so I can tell just the logistical? We're good. <laughs> okay. So now I just will uh, wrap this up. Um, so Carolyn's success is the evidence we need to know that we can overcome racism, oppression, and discrimination. If Carolyn, imagine, like if Carolyn could do that alone, imagine what we all as beast builders can do together to dismantle the systems, the structures, and attitudes of racism and oppression. Um, and like just you heard Carolyn say, give her a break and we will give you a break, Carolyn. We, I mean, we pledge to, uh, to be on the right side of history uh, as beast builders. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you on Together for Peace season two. Please watch for details of Together for Peace on our Facebook page, website, and mailings from the Rag of Bee. I want to give you special thank you to the thousands of you out there who have made Together for Peace a success uh, by watching, following us on Facebook, and uh, sharing the, the videos. The number of views is, is, is striking. Uh, by your participation, Together we could engage in thoughtful discussions and compassionate actions for peace building worldwide. You are the engine behind the rotary wheel for peace. Thank you for helping Together for Peace realize the power of turning our living rooms into platforms for positive peace action, collaboration, and um, education. Until we meet again, stay safe, stay healthy, keep your smile big and your heart open, and have a wonderful weekend. Wage Beast, thank you all for making this a success. To the speakers, to the team, big shout out to Anna. I don't get to, uh, um, to thank her often. Um, so if you want to leave, you can leave, but I have to thank um, my team, uh, the production team, um, and Anna especially because she's been a great support. Um, thank you for all the hard work you're doing behind the scenes, Anna. You're my star. Um, and um, we all thank you on, 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 on my behalf. And I would love to thank um, all the fans and the dedicated uh, people who are watching us every week and sharing and, um, the episodes with their friends and family and inviting Rotarians and um, other people to learn about um, the causes that we um, celebrate and um, advocate for. So thank you all, Carolyn. Again, I can't thank you enough for your time and just being with us. It's an honor. Thank you. Have a great, have a great weekend, everybody. White peace. Bye.